going to make paella mixed up. Making paella, it's very relatable to breaking rules. I want to do it with more flavors, more ingredients, different things. That's kind of how I look at food. Learn all the rules, learn how to do it the right way, and then you can figure out what rules you can break. My name is Jamie Bissonette. I'm the chef and partner of Toro Copa Boston and Toro Noodle. Teaching people how to cook is something that's really important to me. Growing up, I fell into straight edge, punk rock, hardcore. Straight edge is living clean. Don't smoke, don't drink, don't do drugs. A lot of people were vegetarian and vegan, no promiscuous sex. It was really hard to find someone to cook a vegetarian and vegan. My mother didn't really do it, and she wasn't a very good cook anyway, so I spent a lot of time cooking for myself, cooking for my friends, and I really developed a palate for it. And then eventually I was working for a chef who told me, listen, you're a good cook, but as a vegetarian, you're never gonna be a great chef unless you wanna just cook vegetarian food, which I didn't. I wanted to be a chef cooking all kinds kinds of foods. You're not eating your food. You're not understanding how all the flavors going together. And he said, you know, you should start eating meat if you're really serious about this craft. And I started eating meat pretty immediately and fell back into being an omnivore. But so growing up in the hardcore punk community, you know, you learn a lot about breaking the rules. And that's kind of how I look at food. Learn all the rules, learn how to do it the right way, and then you can figure out what rules you can break. Making paella, I think it's very relatable to breaking rules. I want to do it with more flavors, more ingredients, different things. I love the improv of cooking. I love the improv in making paella. If I couldn't cook anymore, chances are I'd be in jail. Teaching people how to cook is something that's really important to me. It's the quintessential thing to being a chef. Being a chef is being a leader and teaching the people to, to do what you want them to do and making the great cooks around you into chefs as well. So today we're gonna make a uh, paella mixta, my first cook along, and paella mixta is great because it's simple to make, it's got four easy steps, it's a one pot meal, and we can have a lot of innovation. Play around with lots of different ingredients. Typical paellas can be Valencianas, that's one kind of paella, very specific. Anything else is a mixta, mixed ingredients. And what better place to find mixed ingredients than Chinatown, New York, where you've got the hustle and bustle, the Asian culture, you've got great meat, great produce and awesome seafood. So I prepared a little video for you guys to watch of me sourcing the ingredients and kind of walking around Chinatown. You can watch that while the rice is cooking. So the first thing we need to do before we start cooking is gather all of our mise en place, literally things in place. Um, and for that, every professional kitchen does it. It's how you organize, it's having prior preparation, preventing piss poor performance. It's so you nail it every single time. So go through your recipe and we'll get the mise en place. For the paella mixta, you're gonna need the following tools. An 18 inch paella pan, or if you don't have a paella pan, because not everybody has one, just use like a similarly medium sided, heavy bottom pan. Not cast iron, but ceramic or something heavy thick, that will work. Something that's gonna conduct the, the temperature evenly. You're gonna need a wooden spoon so we can stir things around without agitating the bottom of the pan. I think it's important for always cooking to have a tasting spoon. Super important, measuring spoons. Measuring cups, scraper. Of course, you're going to need a knife and cutting board. And it's good to have some extra bowls around just to put all your cut vegetables in. And for the paella mix, so these are the ingredients you're gonna need. You're gonna need cauliflower rice, which is a, a nice short grain rice, shorter than arborio, which everybody knows for risotto. It's from Spain. If you can't find bamba or cauliflower rice, if it says paella rice, you're golden. Uh, you're also gonna need extra virgin olive oil. Some people like to use canola oil. I like extra virgin. I like to look to see that it's single varietal, so we try to look to see what kind of olives it was made out of. Look for a harvest date. If it says when it was made or when it expires, you're dealing with a much higher end, better olive oil. You're gonna get more flavor out of it. Great olive oil can add pepper, can add creaminess, so don't, don't skimp on the olive oil. Well, we're also going to use some beautiful little neck clams, and little neck clams are gonna be 
add great seafood flavor and a little bit more salinity. Uh, growing up in New England, clams are one of those things that I can't deal without. I love them in all of my paellas. We're also going to use some mussels, and that's going to add another seafood component, building the flavor of the paella. And these are great, good bang for your buck. They're pretty inexpensive, so you can add a lot of these to feed a lot of people. Next, we have some shrimp. We bought some shell-on shrimp at the market. Uh, they're beautiful. We're going to leave the shells on them so they stay really plump. They give off a little bit of flavor, but they're going to have a great texture, and we can kind of peel and eat them when we eat the paella. Alternatively, if you don't want to get that, you can buy peeled and deveined shrimp at the store. No problem. I love to have chicken thighs in my paella. I prefer to do boneless, skinless. I feel like the skin gets kind of gummy and it's nicer and easier to eat with friends when you don't have a bone to cut around. So we go to the market and we just get straight from the butcher, boneless, skinless chicken thighs. You can also use breasts if you don't want to use thighs if you want to go all white meat. We're going to add some blue crabs to the paella today. Uh, if you don't like crab, you don't need to use this. You can add lobster instead. You could use white fish or you could do it without. For me, I'm going to love the way that these crabs flavor the oil when we make the base for this paella. Battle Royale. We're going to add one bell pepper to give it a little bit more vegetable flavor. And we're going to dice that up medium size so it gets good texture. We're also going to dice up one yellow onion, also known as a Spanish onion. Any kind of onion will do. Don't, don't fret. If you don't have a white or Spanish onion, you can use a yellow onion, whatever you'd like. If you want to use leeks, that's cool too. But I, I like yellow onions. They've got great texture, and that's going to be a great base flavor for the paella. We grabbed some scallions at the market. We'll use the bottom parts of the scallions that are a little bit tougher in the base of the paella, and we'll finish the paella with the greens on top, and that's going to give it a little bit more fresh vegetal flavor and a little bit more of that allium or onion flavor that is so great with paella. Oh, another thing we lo I love adding to paella is garlic. So we're going to peel some and mince some garlic, add that to the base of the paella to give it a little bit more punch, a little bit more fragrance. We grabbed some cauliflower, some more vegetable to put in the paella. That's great for texture and just, I love cauliflower. So we're going to put it in there. If you don't want to use cauliflower, don't worry about it. You don't have to. You could add Brussels sprouts, asparagus, really any vegetable that's in season. Part of the base of making the paella is something called sofrito, which is just cooked out tomato paste. So we're going to use some tomato paste. We're going to cook that into the paella. That's going to add a great base, and it's going to help us develop the socarrat, the little burned bits in the bottom of the paella pan. For me, a paella is not paella, even though many recipes are out there. It isn't paella without chorizo, so we're going to use some dry cured chorizo from Spain. You can use pretty much any sausage you want. I prefer this one because it has a lot of paprika in it and garlic, so it's going to give a nice base flavor as well. We grabbed some water spinach at the market. We're going to chop this up and finish the paella with it. If you don't have this or you don't see this kind of thing at the market, you can totally use regular spinach or even arugula. Or if you don't want, you don't have to use it at all. Frozen peas to top the paella. I love peas in my paella. Peas and rice is a classic combination. I love frozen peas because they're always consistently creamy. A lot of time peas are starchy. They get picked out of season or when they're not ready. Uh, frozen peas are consistently delicious. So this is what we're going to throw in the paella. Of course, when you're making anything, don't forget your salt. Uh, I like to use kosher salt, but any salt will do if you want to use fine sea salt or any table salt, that's fine. But remember, salt has different salinities, so taste it as you go to make sure that you don't end up with something too salty. Uh, and last, we're going to use a little bit of water. Uh, you can use stock. I don't like making stock at home, so I feel like with all the other ingredients, we can build the base so when using water in our paella, we're still going to have a delicious dish. All right, so this paella has four kind of simple steps. First step is prep uh, vegetables and proteins. Second step is cook paella. Third step is going to be taste and adjust seasoning. That's a very important step. And the last is going to be garnish and enjoy. If you're ready, I'm ready. Let's get going. Step one, prepping the vegetables and the proteins. We're going to start by uh, dicing up an onion. Uh, a lot of people get taught to dice an onion a very specific way. Uh, if you've been taught the way everybody learned, I hopefully you'll adopt my way. So we'll cut off the, the top side. That's the side that grows out of the ground. Uh, then we're going to cut it in half. We're going to leave the root on because that'll help hold it together. From there, we're going to cut the onion again into a quarter. So from here, it's going to be easier to peel. We can get the peel off from the outside. 
We leave the root of the onion on to hold it all together. That way you don't end up with just all these pieces kind of flailing about. Uh, the next thing is I like to take the onion from here and break it in half. So just simply break it into two pieces. So you've got the core, which we'll cut after, and the outer leaves. So rather than what everybody teaches you to do this way, then this way, where how many times has somebody done that to their thumb? I've done it about 100 times. This makes it easier. So from here, we're going to just cut our onion into a nice dice. Now, a dice can be any size you want it. I like mine to be about a quarter of an inch by a quarter of an inch. Um, doing it this way, you end up with it cooking nice and evenly, not having to go the latitude and longitude style, I always call it. Makes it safer, a lot more consistent. And then when you get to the core, it's two cuts, turn, two cuts again. So you've got a bit nice base to make it nice and, uh, nice and easy to cut, nice and safe. So again, we're going to take that half onion, take out the core, flatten out the outside, kind of cut it into almost a julienne, leaving the, the stem side attached, and then go across again into a dice. With the core piece, you can go a couple times across, then using the flat side, roll it. So again, we're just gonna roll it up, cut it again, and now when you cut across, you end up with perfect little dice. Onions add a base flavor to so many different dishes, anything from marinara to, to paella. And what this is going to add is it's going to add that, like, that kind of astringency, that sweetness as it cooks out, the vegetal flavor, and it's just a great base. I find that adding my onions in the beginning of cooking and a, a nice medium temperature is a great way to coax out their flavor. And when we add the onion to the pan, we're going to add a good amount of salt. One of the most common mistakes that I see people doing when they're making paella or cooking onions at all is being afraid to use salt earlier in the process. Using the salt a little earlier in the process will pull out some of the moisture from the onion, kind of letting it cook in its own juices and getting more flavor and definitely a little bit more sweetness. So I always like having a scraper around so I don't have to use my knife on the cutting board and we'll use the scraper to move our onions into the bowl. One of the things we always say at the restaurant, clean as you go, sign of a pro. You want to make sure that you're not uh, just leaving a mess all over your table, all over the cutting board, because you know, your mise en place is all these things out here, but your mise en place is also up here. The, the messier you are on your station, the harder it's going to be for you to follow the directions. So make sure you kind of clean up, be really organized as you're cooking. The next step for the paella is going to be the garlic. So the way that I've always taught to, to clean garlic is to just kind of break it, pull out what you're going to need. For this, we're going to use a few cloves. You know, the recipe will change depending upon the size of garlic. So if you buy really, really uh, fresh garlic at the market and they're small, you're going to want to use a little bit more. If you've got um, bigger ones like this, you're going to want to use a little bit less. And the way that I like to cut garlic is just kind of smash it. Don't hit it with all your might because you don't want to shatter it. Then you can't, get the, you can't get the skin off of it. But that's enough to get the skin and get to the center. There we are. Now from here, there's a little stem on the garlic. I like to trim that off. Again, that's the part that can be a little bit astringent and uh, kind, of, kind of acrid, not, not a great flavor. So we've got our garlic pieces from here again. Just take the smaller ones and kind of smash it. Alternatively, if you're, you know, feeling particularly lazy and you're at the market and you see a jar of pre-chopped garlic, don't do it. This is worth it. You, you're, that garlic's going to start to taste terrible. It makes your refrigerator smell bad. You don't want to do it. So after you, uh, you kind of crush your garlic, you just want to run your knife through it a couple of times. Now, go through just about as many times as you want. If you like having chunks of, of garlic in your, in your food, go for it. If you want it to be really, really fine, you can do that as well. Personally, I don't like to go too, too fine. 
I like to keep it a little rustic and chunky like that. This is kind of like crushed chopped garlic. If you really wanted to mince it, you could put your knife to it and really cook it, like kind of smash it into a paste or run your knife over it again and again until it looked like salt. So this is our, our, chopped or minced, our chopped garlic. So when you mince garlic, you're gonna end up cooking out, getting a lot of flavor out of it, but no texture. For me, what I like is we're gonna cook the garlic gently. It's gonna be tender, cook for a long time, but we're still gonna have some chunks of garlic in our food, which I think are great. Next ingredient we're gonna cut is the red bell pepper. So red bell pepper, I like to kind of cut them open to see what's going on inside first. So I like to cut the top off and look in. And from looking in, Make sure that sometimes peppers, you, they can lie to you. They can have a little bit of mold inside and you want, might not be able to tell. If you're feeling for firm peppers when you're buying them at the market, you're gonna be a lot more successful. You're not gonna see that. But just in case, I cut the top off. Next, I like to cut off the base. And what that does is that gives us a little stable ground. So looking down, you can see the ribs. And we're gonna kinda put our knife and cut straight down that way. Basically like we're cutting the four walls off of a house. And that way you end up with some pieces that are a little bit easier to work with. And from here, a lot of times I like to leave the, the skin side down. That way if your knife isn't as sharp as it should be, you can get through this without ending up with what I call uh, uh, like kind of the strings or like a kite, like they all stick together. So this way you can run your knife through all the way. We want to cut that into a julienne and then again into a dice about the same size as the onions. Now, if you're like, well, I really love peppers, you can double the amount of peppers in the paella. If you really like it chunky, you can leave them cut even bigger. I like cutting the peppers and the onions about the same size because of continuity of cooking. So when you're eating the paella, getting like one big chunk of pepper, one big chunk of onions, not great. You know, here it's gonna be about getting a bite of rice with all of the vegetables in it. So you can get, every bite's gonna count and every bite's gonna be delicious. And then you let the seafood and the meat be the things that give you the, the different textures. I like using red peppers because they're sweeter. Uh, green peppers to me are a little bit too vegetal, uh, but you can totally, if you've got green peppers, yellow peppers, purple peppers, whatever kind of pepper you'd like. The only thing I'm careful of, if, if the peppers are spicy, you want to be a little bit careful. So again, using the scraper, keeping our station clean, we're going to put the peppers into their own bowl. All right, uh, next thing we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to prep our scallions. We're going to prep our scallions into two, two ways. We're going to do the bottom parts, the white parts, this part right here, that we're going to cook in the beginning of the paella, and then the green part, the more tender part of it, we're going to do at the end, so we're going to garnish with that. So we'll slice that here. Um, one thing I've noticed is my cutting board is moving around on me. I do this at home and I always forget to do it when I start cooking and it's about halfway through and a glass of wine into my cooking that I realize I haven't done it yet. I'm gonna put a wet towel underneath to anchor it. So we're just gonna take a regular old towel, get it damp, put it underneath and that way it's like a, a pad so the, the cutting board doesn't slide around. Don't have it be too wet or you're gonna make a mess all over your counter but you know, put it about the same size as your cutting board. And that should, that should help pretty good. All right. So next with the uh, scallions, when I cut off the roots, the root end, and we can just discard that. And then take a look. And if it looks dirty, you just want to peel off the exterior. Make sure that they're nice and clean. Generally, the scallions you see at the market are pretty good, but every once in a while, you get some that have those little blemishes and the dirtiness, so you just kind of want to peel off that one outer layer, just like you would with a, a Spanish onion or a yellow onion. Now we're going to line up the scallions with the stem side down. So this is the side that we're going to cook. And you can see where they turn color. So white is where they're kind of like more like garlic, really like more acrid and really oniony. And as they get up, they get a little bit more mild. So we're going to cut right as they start to branch out and become more mild. And we're going to save that for our garnish. And then we're going to cut these and add them to the onions to cook out in the beginning. 
So here we want to cut them about the same size, uh, but we'll leave them in circles. So cut them about the width of a pencil. Uh, one of the things I love about adding all different kinds of onions and alliums, like garlic, scallions, and onions together in a paella, is building more and more flavor. Uh, the other thing is, I don't like wasting anything. And having the green tops the, at the end of the paella, super fresh, super bright, uh, but I don't want to waste the bottoms. And the bottoms are a little bit too, too acidic and, and strong for me to put in the beginning. Uh, next, we're going to go into the chorizo. This is a Spanish style chorizo or a cured chorizo. There are lots of different kinds of chorizo. Chorizo in some cultures means sausage and it's general, can mean any kind of sausage. In other cultures, it's a specific kind of sausage called the chorizo. In Spain, chorizo is made with lots of smoked paprika and garlic and they can be fresh or cured, so uh, or spicy and sweet as well. So this is a regular kind. It's not very spicy. Has lots of smoked, pep most lots of smoked paprika, which gives it like a good earthiness and a richness. Uh, it's pork and pork fat, garlic, and that's about it. And uh, curing it, so cooking it like a letting it cure like a salami or a prosciutto gives it a little bit more of a funky flavor and adds a lot more flavor to to the things that you cook it into. Oh. We'll cut off the little uh, nunchuck looking tops. We can throw those away. And then from here, we're gonna cut the, the chorizo into two, two lengths and then cut them straight across like you would cucumbers for a salad. And the cool thing about chorizo and whenever I make paella, I always add like an extra, probably handful of chorizo because when I go to taste for seasoning, I seem to only taste the chorizo for the first 10, 10, or, 10 or so bites. So I end up eating all of this out of it. So if I don't use extra, there's not enough. And don't be worried about having it be too consistent. If you just want to chop up some of it in rounds, some of it in chunks, it's great. It's going to add texture and it's going to make it interesting as you eat it. And this chorizo can be eaten just with cheese. If you have extra, you don't want to put it all in there, slice it up as an hors d'oeuvre. So chorizo is a cured sausage. This one is a cured sausage. And a cured meat is something that is cooked by uh, fermenting it and aging it. So it's meat mixed with salt and sugar. And that creates a reaction where the, the fat breaks down in the proteins and they turn into something. The most common thing I think people are aware of for like a cured meat would be prosciutto, where you take a ham leg, you add salt, and then you allow it to age in a, in a specific temperature with humidity. And that turns it from a raw ham leg into a beautiful cured ham. So this chorizo was just pork mixed and it's aged for about uh, about, about 150 to 200 days. Well, that's it. Uh, the beauty about the chorizo is that's going to be the first thing we add. And we can add that to the cold pan, so I'm just going to chuck it right in. I think chorizo is a, gr a great, uh, great ingredient to work with because it's pretty commonly found. Whether you find a really good imported uh, dry aged one from Spain or you see just your local butcher has one that they make or one at the grocery store, don't be afraid. If you love a sausage, you can add it to paella. I mean, I've, I've made paella with breakfast sausage and pretty much loved it. So, you know, chorizo is my, my preference, but any sausage goes. So next we're going to cut the tops of the scallions for garnish so they're ready for later. Uh, one of the things that I find the easiest for cutting scallions is I just take a, a wet paper towel and uh, just get it wet. Wring it out. And then I lay it out and wrap the little amount of scallions that I want to cut at a time and roll it up. That way, they don't move around. Same thing will work if you're cutting chives. And now here, we can just let the knife do the work and gently push it through as thin as you can cut it. And if you can't cut it as thin as I can, well, good, because I've been doing this for 20 years and you haven't. But if you can, do it. Cut it as thin as you can. When you get to the middle, you can just kind of push more of them out, like a push-up pop, and keep cutting. And what's great about this is it adds like a little bit of finesse and it makes your, your paella look wicked pretty at the end. You know, a lot of people ask me how I feel about pretty food versus not pretty food and it's a double-edged sword. You know, there's sometimes you get a dish that looks beautiful but doesn't taste great so you're not going to order it again. And sometimes you get food that just tastes absolutely awesome but doesn't look great. 
I find that if you find that awesome balance of making delicious food and then doing what you can to make it look pretty, you're gonna be much more successful than other people. You, eat, you do certainly eat with your eyes first and making it look pretty just shows that you put thought into it. And for me, cooking is all about love. Like I cook for strangers for a living and I cook for friends for fun. So if I can take a little extra step to slow down and make something look beautiful, I'm totally gonna do it and I encourage you to as well. So as you can see, we're continually wiping down our station, looking for anything that doesn't belong and keeping it clean. Uh, that's really important because the first time I make a paella, I, I definitely want to keep my, my, my station nice and clean. The second time I make the paella, I usually have beer and wine everywhere, and if I'm not super clean, I'm probably going to spill my beer. Uh, next, we're going to go into the cauliflower. So the cauliflower... It's beautiful, even the stem of cauliflower is delicious. You can eat the whole thing. So when I get cauliflower, I just like to cut it kind of randomly into just bite-sized pieces with no rhyme or reason. And I like it because as it cooks, it adds different texture. So you'll get some bites that are tiny and some bites that are bigger. And I find that really fun and interesting to eat when I'm making paella. Yeah, when you're cooking the cauliflower, size doesn't matter. You're gonna have little pieces like that because as you cut cauliflower, it crumbles and you wanna, even if you're trying to get them all exactly the same, it's not gonna happen. And as you cook it and stir it, those florets are gonna break off. So it's really, it's really okay to have them be however size they end up being. Uh, next, we're gonna take a little bit of this water spinach. The stem is pretty tender, so we're just gonna take the, the top part and uh, just kind of rough chop it with the stem still in it. Grab another bowl. All right, next for the paella, we're gonna cut our chicken. And uh, for the chicken, we're just gonna take the boneless, skinless thighs and kind of cut them however you want. Again, no rules here. Uh, cut them into about pieces about the size of a, a little bit bigger than a quarter. And put them back on, their, on your plate. I cut the chicken last because I don't want to get all, all the other things on my cutting board. You know, you don't want to have all your, your vegetables cross-contaminated and sitting around. And after I'm done cutting this, I can get the cutting board out of here. Uh, two, you want to cut the chicken now because as it cooks, you want it to kind of, you know, break apart. And the thing about chicken thigh is it's tender and you'll end up with these beautiful luscious chunks. If you braise it whole and then you shred it afterwards, you end up kind of drying it out. So it's best if you cut it before you braise it for this particular one. Um, and then last, we're going to cut our crabs. So we're gonna take a bowl. We're gonna to try to catch as much of the crab juice as possible. So again, if you don't wanna use live crabs at home, you can buy crab meat and throw it in at the end. If you wanna use lobsters, you can totally use lobsters, whatever you want. So we're gonna take these angry little guys. We're gonna put them on the t cutting board. And then just using the knife, we're gonna go right into the head. And don't be afraid, once you cut through, they stop moving. And the thing about the crabs that's awesome is all of that, all of that coral, that is the flavor. So when we add that to the pan, it is going to be delicious. The best way to cut a whole crab is, he bit me. So you gotta be very careful with crabs and pay attention to what you're doing because they are still alive and they will bite you. Um, so this one we're going to kill rather quickly and the best way to kill it is to put the blade right through the head. And then cut through the other side. If you try to cut through all at once, you risk the knife sliding off of it. So we've got made it a little bit. And that'll teach you to bite me. Right, so after we're done cutting the crabs, all of our mise en place is pretty much ready to start cooking. I'm just going to get rid of the, uh, the contaminated equipment and we can start working clean. Second step is cook paella. All right, so now uh, we'll jump right into cooking. We're gonna move our, our pan to the center burner because I like to shake it and move it around while it's cooking. We're gonna turn the heat on. We're gonna start it off like just above medium, not quite high with the chorizo. And we'll add a little bit of the olive oil to the pan. And uh, this is going to warm up gently and that cured meat and all that fat and paprika and flavor is going to kind of leach out. And you're going to see this is going to turn from being like a yellow olive oil to, to like a red olive oil. And as that happens, then we're going to add our onions. Uh, so 
And this is where the wooden spoon is gonna come in. So we're gonna wanna move things around. So we're gonna keep the temperature just over medium so it comes up pretty, pretty quickly, but not too, too fast. You don't wanna blast it on high. Uh, the key to using a wooden spoon is keep the front edge of your, your, your pan away from the flame and you can leave the wood in there the entire time. If you push it back too far and the heat starts coming up, you'll burn your, your wood spoon and you don't want to do that. If you use a metal spoon, the handle will get hot. You'll be cooking, you'll have fun, you'll grab it, you'll burn yourself. That's no bueno, we don't like that. As you can see that the olive oil is starting to pull out some of that paprika and garlic flavor. I'm gonna get this out of the way because I'm a klutz and I don't want to knock it over and ruin all of my mise en place. So. As it starts to, to warm up, you're gonna to start to see the bubbles. When you start to see the bubbles, that's when you know the cooking's starting to happen. Another thing about paella is we're gonna stir it a lot in the beginning, but once we add the rice, we're not gonna stir it again. Uh, when you make paella, stirring the rice and aggravating all of the starch is bad for the paella. You end up making it gummy, and the bottom will start to take all the starch and char. Uh, so the key is gonna to be to kind of shake it, and then spin it, and spinning it's gonna help us get that nice even burned sokarat on the bottom. Another thing to remember whenever you're cooking in, in, a, in a heavy bottom pan, as you add ingredients, your ingredients are gonna drop the temperature of the pan. So when we add our onions, it's not gonna be at medium high anymore. So if you're gonna add three things and you add them all at once, all you're gonna do is end up kind of like cooling everything off and slowing down the process. So having some patience and adding a little bit here and a little bit there, you're gonna end up cooking faster and you're gonna coax out a lot more of the flavor. Another thing that I like to do is make sure that I let my clams and mussels sit out as I'm cooking uh, because they're like little ice cubes. They're gonna cook all the way through, they're gonna be delicious, but if they're warmer than they are colder, when I add them to it, it's not gonna drop the temperature and cause my paella to stop cooking. As soon as this chorizo starts to get a little bit like kind of crispy on one side, we'll add the onions. I like to always have a tasting spoon around so I can you know, taste my things as I go. Um, and also helps me so I can do things like that. I can flip over little pieces to see what, what's going on in the bottom. This is great. You can see it's starting to smoke. The, the chorizo is starting to cook. Uh, it's very fragrant, it smells awesome in here. You can smell the chorizo, the garlic, the paprika. Now we're gonna add the onions, garlic, and scallions. So I like to make a little hole right in the middle of the pan when I'm adding to a, a one pot meal like this so I can incorporate things together and uh, but start off with where the hottest point of the pan is. So one of the things that you want to you want to look for is you want a little bit of smoke and steam coming out as you're making the paella. If you start to see a little bit of smoke coming up, that's okay. You're doing it all right. Turn on the hoods if you have a nice house at home or unplug your fire detectors and your smoke alarms. Otherwise, you're going to set them off. But other than that, you really want that. You want to start to create that Maillard reaction, which is getting the pan hot enough that the, the proteins and the sugars in the proteins are starting to caramelize. And that's what makes a great grilled steak delicious. And that's what's going to make the chorizo really flavorful in this. As soon as I add the onions, I want to grab and I want to add a little bit of my salt. Uh, you don't have to use the measurement for the salt. I like to because I like to keep track of how much salt I'm putting in. You want to salt high and let it fall everywhere like, like snow is, right? If you just kind of, like a lot of people will take their salt and just throw it in, it's going to stick just to one part. No matter what you stir, salt starts to cure things immediately. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to just stick to one part. You also want to make sure you add your salt in the beginning of the, of the paella, beginning of any of cooking of onions, because it's going to pull out some of the moisture from the onions and you're going to end up with better flavor. Rather than just cooking onions in olive oil, adding the salt is going to leach out some of the onion juice, so you're now cooking in olive oil, salt, and onion juice. So you're ending up with more flavor. And the key to paella is layering all different depths of flavor. So as I cook paella, I keep stirring until I add the rice, and I also keep turning the pan. That way I'm creating an even cooking temperature all over the bottom. If you don't have a gas stove, I don't have one at home, you can still do this. You just want to keep turning it a little bit more often. Uh, that way you don't end up with a hot spot and have one spot, one spot start to stick. If you feel like your paella is cooking a little bit too hot and you've got something where it's caramelizing and starting to like darken in the pan, Pull it off the heat, add a little bit of water, and let the water kind of evaporate, maybe a tablespoon of water at a time, and that'll deglaze it, 
evaporate, and then when you keep cooking, it's going to concentrate the flavors without getting that burned flavor, that acrid flavor that burning onions can give. So as the onions are cooking, a lot of times I start the paellas and I don't cut my other vegetables until I've actually started cooking because I'm faster and I can go, I can push on. So the first time you make your paella, set out your mise en place. The second time, push yourself to be a little bit faster. And as you're cooking your onions, now is the time that you could use to dice your peppers. You've got a couple of minutes as the onions start to soften. Add a little bit more salt. I tasted the onions and they're good, but they could use a little bit of salt. And I look at the paella when I'm tasting anything that I cook. I taste every step and I say, if I was gonna stop cooking right now, how does this taste? And if, if it doesn't taste great, then I, I need to adjust it, whether it's more salt, more pepper, more fat. Uh, and for this, since I know it's just the beginning of something, I added a little bit more salt. I don't want it to be salty, but I want the onions to taste seasoned. If I tasted the onions and the first thing I tasted was salt, I wouldn't have added any more. So now we can see the onions are starting to get tender. They're starting to caramelize just a little, little bit, which is okay. I'm gonna give the pan a little shake. I do this often so everything distributes kind of evenly and creates one kind of cohesive mass on the bottom. Um, and that's keeping the pan at a, at a good constant temperature. And I'm ready to add the peppers. So the peppers, just add right, right on top of the onions. And then we're gonna fold the peppers in, kind of like allow them to kind of cook with the onions. There's no need to add any more salt to it yet. Hopefully there's enough seasoning in there that that'll, uh, that'll all incorporate now well. We just wanna cook the peppers for about a minute or so to take the rawness off of them. And as onions cook, sometimes they absorb a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of the fat. So I want a little bit more base layer of oil. That oil, as it cooks in the paella, is going to be something that emulsifies with the water and all the juices of the seafood. It's going to make it creamier. Yeah, that looks great. So now I'm going to add our crab. So the crab, we're just going to kind of place in a little bit haphazardly, wherever they go, and we're just gonna kinda let them, let them warm up. So there's a little bit of juice and stuff and a little gelée that came out of the crab after we cut it. We'll dump that in as well, more flavor. I'm just stirring the pan around a little bit to uh, distribute the heat, make sure everything is starting to mingle together, to really kind of mix and make beautiful, beautiful flavors. There's got to be a little bit of harmony in your cooking, right? When you hear, you know, a, a band playing and there's too much bass or too much drums, it's, it's not as pleasant as when everything's mixed together. So as you're cooking, that's what you want to keep doing. You want to just keep making sure that everything is mixing well to make something beautiful. Uh, while that's happening, I'm going to season our chicken just a little bit. So the chicken, just going to season a little bit of salt. Again, you see how I'm seasoning really high and letting it fall all over the place? This is the one time where I'm okay with getting a little bit of salt and making a mess on your table. Because you want to season nice and evenly. And by doing it high like that, it ends up not clumping. Same with you do a salad, you're doing a burger, you're seasoning tofu, anything you do, season evenly. That way every bite has the equal amount of salt. You don't end up with one bite salty and one bite bland. I'm gonna slide the chicken in, kind of stir it around. We're just gonna let the chicken cook in a little bit of this crab chorizo and onion fat. Again, notice I turn the pan again, continually turning, kind of, I think, after every ingredient I add, I turn it about maybe, maybe 15 minutes if it was a clock. So the beautiful thing about, about a paella mixta is it can be anything, it's mixed. You can have it be mixed with vegetables and seafood. You can have it be with mixed with meat and vegetables, meat and seafood. 
meat, poultry and seafood, whatever you want. And that's what's beautiful about making this. So now I can see that the heat's up good. We're starting to get some really great caramelization. The crab is starting to get cooked. And the inside, like all that beautiful, the beautiful like tamale and head of the crab is starting to, to warm up and leach out. That's gonna add some great flavor as well. I'm gonna add our tomato paste that we're gonna use like sofrito. Um, if you wanna measure it, you can. If not, I kinda eyeball it. I, I wanna know that it's gonna be enough to coat everything in the paella. So we'll squeeze it right in the middle. Uh, so you see, added just about enough to stir around. You can always add more. So I'm gonna add it and stir it. And that's one of the things that's great about using the tube is if you don't use all of it, you don't have to waste it or take it out of that can. I hate opening cans and trying to scoop things out and wrap them. So for me, it's easier if I add a little bit and then I want more, I can add more. And then this goes in the fridge and lasts a lot longer than the can. So as we add the tomato paste, we just want to turn the pan, kind of mix everything around to make sure it's all incorporated. You can see that the, the crab is starting to get red and nice and toasted. That's totally flavoring everything. And then we want to scrape down the sides a little bit. We don't want anything to burn. We've added enough ingredients now. We just want to let this pan come back to temperature and we can get ready to measure out our rice. So, if you don't have uh, measuring cups, don't worry. The ratio for paella is f about four to one. And I say about four to one because if you've got a really hot fire, it can be a little bit more liquid and a little bit cold fire, a, bit, a little bit less. But if you remember four to one, you're pretty golden. So we're gonna do one cup of rice to four cups of liquid. Uh, for this pan, we're gonna do one and a half cups of rice. So we'll add our half cup first. Now, just like every other ingredient we've added, we want to make sure we combine everything before adding the next ingredient. We want to make sure that we're letting the pan come back to being the proper temperature again. Great. Here again, I'm just going to season with a little bit more salt nice and evenly, so when I add the liquid, the rice immediately is gonna start to absorb. We've got a nice even seasoning. And I'm gonna measure out all of my, my water for this into one pan. Now, when measuring your water or using your stock, your stock can totally be hot if you want it to be. It can also be room temperature, but you don't want your stock to be right out of the refrigerator or cold. One of the beauty, beautiful things about cooking at home is I use the pan that I had put the crab in that had a little bit of the crab juice left into it. So when I add the water to it, it's pulling out a little bit more of that flavor. So now we want to make sure nothing's sticking, nothing's burning, nice and hot, and we're ready to add our stock. And we're going to add it right in the center. And it should simmer immediately as we add it. That's a good sign that your temperature is right. Paella is one of those things, when the first time you make it, you're gonna think your, plan, your pan is too hot the entire time. Don't be afraid, you really do. You wanna cook it hot. So as soon as you add the liquid, I just wanna flip the crab around a little bit to make sure that all of the rice is underwater. If the rice is sitting on top of the crab, it's not cooking and you're gonna end up with beautifully cooked rice with a couple pieces of raw rice. That's, uh, that's no bueno, you don't want that crunch. We can now crank the heat up a little bit higher, almost to full blast, until it comes to a simmer. 
At this point now, we're gonna kind of retire our wooden spoon and use just our tasting spoon. We're not gonna stir again. If you don't put your wooden spoon away, you're gonna feel that temptation to scrape the bottom and stir it, and then you're gonna end up with a gummy paella. So from here, it's gonna be a lot of shaking and a lot of, uh, a lot of spinning. Third step is gonna be taste and adjust seasoning. It's coming up pretty quickly. I'm gonna give it a quick taste. So what I'm tasting for now is a little bit of salt. Oh my God, the seafood flavor in the crab is re already really coming out, which is awesome. But I wanna see if it's really salty right now, we've got a problem, so we'd have to start all over. Uh, but it's not, it's pretty good. I wanna add a little bit more seasoning now because as the rice cooks, it's only gonna be a certain amount of time before it'll stop absorbing all of that salinity and you really don't wanna end up with, uh, with undercooked rice. With a lot of dishes, if you add too much salt, there's things you can do to fix it. With rice, if you add too much salt, that's it, because all that salt gets inside. So you've got to really be deft. That's why I say season often. If something says it needs two tablespoons of salt, probably I didn't write the recipe, because I like to say salt to taste. And by that, I mean add salt, taste it, add salt, taste it. And you'll find that if you add salt and taste over and over again, you'll use less salt than if you just try to season something at the end. So people who think, oh, as I'm cooking, I'm just gonna salt at the end, that way I don't have so much sodium in my diet, you're probably going to end up adding more salt and have you know, higher, higher problems than if you season as you go. So this comes up, you can see it's starting to simmer already. As Soon as it simmers, I add the clams. The clams of the, of the rest of the shellfish are gonna take the longest to cook. And we're gonna kinda scatter them around everywhere. The next thing I'm gonna add is the cauliflower. And again, we're just gonna kinda plop that in, let it cook however. Wherever it cooks, it cooks. Don't worry about you know, proper placement. Just kinda scatter it around. If you put it all in one spot, you're gonna drop the temperature of that part of the pan and cook unevenly. Now we're gonna turn the heat down so it stays at just a simmer, but not a rapid boil. I like to give it a shake to make sure it's not sticking. And again, we're not gonna stir it again, so this is where this spoon comes in very handy, or a fork. And we just put it in and kind of touch. And if you feel like it's sticking to the bottom of the pan, you wanna move that part off of the heat. And you wanna keep go doing that until you end up with a little bit of caramelization on the bottom everywhere, and the rice fully cooked. So from here, it'll probably take about 20 minutes. We want to make sure that it's not at a rapid boil. So you see big bubbles, really a lot of agitation. That's going to evaporate faster. That's going to caramelize the bottom too quickly. So we want to turn it down just a little bit. When I make paella outside, this is when I kind of lift it up, you know, get it higher away from the wood or kind of knock down the charcoal. And the difference between a simmer and a boil is a boil is like how you want to cook pasta, how it's like the water is really agitating like a hot jacuzzi. And a simmer is more like, like a bubble bath. You want it to be percolating just a little bit. Slowly the bubbles are rising to the top, almost like beautiful champagne. It's a lot more gentle and you're gonna end up cooking, getting flavors extracted like a lot cleaner. Another thing that's really great about paellas is like, I don't know how it is at your house, but at my house, all the parties end up hanging out in the kitchen. Maybe it's just because I put the record player in the kitchen and that's where the wine is. But a lot of times it's because this is cool to cook, man. Like watching people cook paella and like taking all these different random ingredients, seemingly putting them together with rice to make something like so luscious and unctuous is cool. It's a beautiful presentation piece. And I suggest buying a, a nice paella pan because that's something that's really great to just drop down on a table. You could feed like eight or 10 people out of a pan like this. This is a really fun dish to cook for people. 
Now, paella is like the original party dish in my mind. You know, in Spain, this is cooked typically outdoors on top of last year's like vine clippings and orange and pine. Uh, it's super hot and like a lot of the men in the region, they don't have any hair from the knees down because they're outside in shorts, walking around these big pans, lifting them up, burning all the hair off their legs. It's, it's pretty awesome and it's a really fun thing to do. You know, so as we're looking, we don't see that over here it's not cooking as much because you know, we're, when you're cooking at home and you've got a big pan, you're not going to get the fire everywhere evenly. So that's why you've got to kind of shift your pan around. So we'll slide it over to make sure that for a little while over here is cooking just as over here does. And if you keep an eye on it and pay attention to it, you know, there's a certain extent of set it and forget it with a paella, but you still need to cook with all of your senses. You know, we're cooking with our nose and our ears and our tongues. We're tasting we're looking and we're listening. That sound, that beautiful sound of the bubbles popping, when you start to hear it get tighter and it start, goes from being like a bass drum to a snare drum, that's when it's starting to stick. That's when it's starting to reduce and that's when it's starting to finish. And when you hear that, you know you need to pay attention so you don't scorch the bottom. So this is the point where it's starting to, to really cook evenly. We want to keep spinning it every two or three minutes, but you've got about 10 minutes until, uh, until the next step. So enjoy the video. I hope you have fun walking around Chinatown with me. I feel like I'm part of another culture when I'm here. I love to travel, but sometimes I can't. Coming to Chinatown is awesome for me because it, it's like traveling, but I'm, I'm still in the city I live in and I get to see all the culture. I mean, the food is awesome, but there's so much history, even in the Chinatown neighborhoods that I get to explore and learn more about. So for me, I just, I love it. The great thing about coming to Chinatown is when you get to talk to the purveyors, you get to learn something new. Um, getting the feedback's really hard because my Mandarin and my Cantonese is pretty terrible, but usually they'll point out with uh, a little bit of sure. that, getting to know your purveyor. Here, it's more about pointing and smiling, and when they frown, don't buy it. I love going to farmer's markets. I love going to like organic stores and whatnot, but I love coming to Chinatown because I can get some of the best seafood, awesome vegetables. It's super affordable. And I get my DTO, dumpling timeout. Not every city has one, but when you find one, there's always something great about it. You can find ingredients that aren't common that you won't find at your regular local grocery store. Some of that. And, uh, we're seeing, you know, still the history of whole animal cooking, using local, using fresh, delicious food. There's tradition, and I, I just love tradition. And then you can figure out what rules you can break. Roasted head-on chicken with chicken feet and tripe and pig's ears and all the different sausages. I could stay here all day long. My favorite thing about paella is it's pretty straightforward. It's controlling the temperature of a pan, it's one pot cooking, pretty easy and anything goes. So what we're here today, we're gonna look for whatever great seafood we can find, maybe some head-on shrimp, some great vegetables, it's spring. I always know that in the Chinese markets, the spring vegetables are gonna come here before the grocery store, so maybe we can find some green garlic or something like that. Definitely gonna grab a little bit of cauliflower for the paella. I love cauliflower in my paella. Super not traditional, but super delicious. I love the texture. So when you're looking for cauliflower, you just wanna look for firm pieces. You know, it's kind of like a, a cabbage. I really love being able to explore a big market, kind of just cook with something that I love. And sometimes I find things I've never used before and I like to experiment. I love the punch of, you know, green onions. So we're gonna, we're gonna grab some, some scallions to put on top of the paella to keep it bright. Another awesome thing is seeing things that I don't know what they are. Sometimes it happens in Chinatown. I feel like I know a lot about everything, but walking by this one little bodega market, we found this. Not really sure what to call it, but it's pretty delicious. It has a kind of like a, a tender spinach or a bok choy-like flavor. Then after produce, I'm gonna look for some seafood, maybe some head-on shrimp or local squid. Who knows? I mean, they've got so many different things here. I'm just gonna kinda see what happens. What better way to improvise than with fresh seafood? So we're gonna see if we can find something cool at this market 
Everyone tells me that Haithan Market is the best seafood market in Chinatown. One of the things we always look for is the freshest seafood. When I'm walking down the street, I saw this place. See, the fish are still moving. They're still floundering, so obviously it's pretty fresh. This is the place for me. Anything goes, right? You can do anything you want in it. Vegetarian, vegan, seafood. And here, I'm, I'm inspired by the crabs, so I'm gonna grab some crabs for the paella today. Can I get uh, six crabs? Yeah. Yeah. Blue crab, yeah. Can I have six? For me, adding some, some uh, live crab to the paella, it's gonna get all that like that heady flavor and uh, the shells and roasting that off in the, in the oil in the beginning. If, if you don't wanna use crab or you can't find crab, you can use any shellfish. Well, while we're here, I'm gonna grab some shrimp. These uh, beautiful jumbo shrimp, the blue ones, they, they just look great, so. Uh, I like that the shells are on it. I like to cook my shrimp shells on and peel them afterwards so that it you know, keeps them a little bit more uh, juicy. If you don't like shellfish, all these beautiful whole fish are great. The ocean perch, butterfish, che che. I hope you had fun walking around the Chinatown markets with me. Let's get back to the cook along. Our paella should just about be done. We're gonna get ready to put it on the plate. Welcome back to the cook along. Uh, now we're just kind of continuing to rotate our pan. Kind of the clams that are opening, we want to look inside, make sure all of the rice that's in it is evenly distributed so we don't have raw rice in the clam and that the clam meat is in the bottom part of the shell. So it's continuing to cook in flavor uh, and stay warm. Looking in at the crab a little bit, see how that juice is coming out and really flavoring the paella. And kind of checking the bottom to make sure that we're not getting too scorched but we're still starting to develop our silk rot. So now we're at a point where the clams are starting to open, the rice is, is pretty close to being done. We wanna add the mussels. So the mussels add the last round of flavor and open up and everything cooks at the same time to being done. So the mussels, we're just gonna kinda scatter around however they are. If you like to put them all on one side and make it look pretty, you totally can. For me, we can always arrange it later. I just want them to cook evenly and add some more flavor to the paella. I'm gonna give it a little shake just to see how everything's developing. And when you shake, you wanna watch the way the rice moves. If all of it moves nice, that means we're developing a nice evenly cooked rice. If we shake and one side moves and one side doesn't, that means that it's not absorbing the liquid the proper way. And we're gonna need to turn it and put the wet side or the side that moved the most over the heat. It's 
shaking pretty evenly, uh, so I'm just gonna keep letting it cook. All right, welcome back to the cook along. A uh, couple things we've done, we're just flipping over the cauliflower, the bigger ones to make sure that they're cooking evenly as well, just like we did with the seafood. Uh, continuing to, to shake and spin our pan. And we're gonna add our shrimp. Uh, the shrimp, again, I like mine shell on, so it's peel and eat. It's a little bit messier when you go to eat it later, but I like the texture that it gives to the shrimp. Uh, makes them really plump. If you wanna use peel and devane, you can totally do it. You just wanna kinda pop them in. Again, you want to pop them in some spots that are really warm and still have a little bit of the moisture left because that'll help them cook. And once I add, we'll shake them just to get everything mixed together again. Don't forget to scrape down the sides as needed. So one of the keys, again, why we're shaking and not stirring is stirring agitates everything. It's going to push the rice and all different things. It's going to get the rice on top of the crab, on top of the clams, where it's not going to cook. And stirring calasparo rice develops a little bit too much starch and gluten, which we don't want. This isn't a risotto. We want it to be nice and, and chewy and delicious, not creamy and gummy. As the mussels open, I like to just uh, check them, pop them open, look at the meats. This paella is gonna be pretty banging, man, I gotta say. So now we're just making sure all the shellfish is opening. Uh, sometimes, some people will say, oh, my clams didn't open, they're dead, they're bad. Well, also sometimes clams when they're super fresh will cook and just not open because they're so firm. They're, you know, they're still alive when you start cooking them. So you know, I want to make sure that they are opening, but I also smell. If you want to make sure that you don't smell anything that smells off. It's hard because if you cook something in the paella and it does smell off, you, you risk ruining the whole paella. So as the clams are opening, I make sure that I'm checking them and pulling them out immediately. But that rarely happens because we're going to get great seafood. So hopefully you're getting great seafood and that's not going to be a problem. As the shrimp cook, we just want to flip them over to cook both sides. So we're looking for the shrimp to be pink and firm all the way through. Uh, these were blue shell shrimp from uh, Florida. So we want to make sure that they turn pink and when you feel them that they feel firm all the way through. Uh, the beautiful thing about, about awesome shrimp like this is they cook super quickly. I like cooking shells on in my paella because it, it adds a little bit more flavor to the paella and I like the texture of the shrimp. I like when you, you pull them off and peel them because it forces the shrimp, it kind of insulates them so they cook a little bit firmer 
uh, without getting, you know, kind of overcooked and gummy. A lot of times, shrimp that are poached in a paella like this, if they're out of the shell, can get mealy. This way, they hold together and they, they stay super delicious. So now we're shaking. We can see that the paella is pretty evenly cooked. We want to kind of look in the bottom to see how the socarrat is. Socarrat is that kind of like, like auburn, kind of charred rice in the bottom of the pan. It looks starting to look pretty good. Looks like it could use a little bit more towards the end. So I'm just gonna pull, turn the heat up high and just put the corners on it just to start this rice to stick to the bottom of the pan and create that beautiful crust. The next step is gonna be garnish and enjoy. We're gonna add the last couple, uh, couple garnishes. We've got our bag of peas. And here, I'm just going to take and do a little scattering of them all over. And not a ton. We have a little bit of our water spinach. And then last, some fresh scallion. Now you can hear, it went from before we had that beautiful bass drum sound to that sharp snare drum sound. And that's how we know the evaporation's happening, the rice is starting to almost sound like it's frying, and that's what's developing the socarrat. There we are, cutting the heat. I'm just gonna let the paella sit for a minute. And we're gonna just drizzle a little bit of olive oil over the top. Again, that pepperiness, that freshness will help uh, brighten it up. And this paella is good to go. If you want, you can cut up some lemon if you like lemon with it. Uh, other than that, I like serving it right in the pan. Just put some towels down on a table, drop this in front of your guests, put a spoon in it and allow them to help themselves. Let's check it. Oh man. The rice is perfectly plump. You can see each individual grain. Unlike a risotto, this is, you know, each individual short grain rice, plump tasting of seafood and vegetables. That is great. I'm really glad we grabbed the crab for this. You can taste all of the different ingredients. The rice has really absorbed the flavor of, of crab and onion and garlic and chorizo and all the other mixed seafood. Cauliflower is a great crunch. The water spinach adds a freshness to it. And the, the scallions and the peas, good vegetal. Man, this paella is great. I'm really excited. I wish you could try it. So it's great now. You've got these crab in the middle. What you want to do is you just want to kind of scoop out all that inside, all the guts and stuff like that. And that adds so much flavor. Oh, man. You can take the, hmm, that is really good. Mm. And then you can crack these open if you have a lop, uh, like a lobster cracker or a crab claw cracker, or even just your knife and just kind of bash it and pull out the meat. But the, the most, most important part of the crab is getting it to season the entire paella and then eating all of the beautiful, beautiful flavor inside the head of the crab like this. Like I said before, I love teaching people how to cook. I hope you learned a few tricks today and I hope your paella came out as good as mine did. My name is Jamie Bissonette. Hopefully I'll see you again at another cook along. Be sure to like and subscribe, check us on Instagram, and download the Project Foodie app on the iOS app store. I hope you've enjoyed this Project Foodie cook along and I hope you'll join us for more.